All right, we'll give it about 30 more seconds to let a couple more folks in and then be on our way. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, we're still seeing the, the numbers jumping up here a little bit, but we're going to go ahead and get underway um, with respect to everybody's time this afternoon that you have uh, given to the uh, the Kentucky River Port Summit number three. Um, this is the third uh, River Port Summit that, and the final one as well um, on the statewide strategy for River Port investments. Um, we really feel that this is a critical uh, time to hear from the industry, to hear from um, the, the project team, and uh, also hear from the state. So those are some of the things that we'll be doing um, over the next two days um, and, and really want to encourage your involvement, especially the stakeholders that are, that are av available to participate. This is a time for your voice to be heard. Um, and for you to get some some final input into this um, this important project and study. So that being said, I want to go through just real quick housekeeping. I'll do this, uh, you know, each of the sessions just to remind folks that you have some little buttons across the bottom that control um, the Zoom platform. Most important is the mute unmute. Please, uh, you know, be respectful of this. Uh, summit proceedings and if you have a phone call to take or something like that go ahead and just mute yourself so that we don't have to to hear you get chewed out by your bosses um and if you want to uh also you got the camera button next to it and uh we encourage you if you're going to speak to turn that camera on unless unless you can't um or, or you're not dressed well enough but turn it on and, and we, that way we can kind of see and get some attention um if, if there's a lot of folks on here um that we, we make sure to, to, to get your uh, comment or your uh, question answered. The chat box is important. We're really gonna utilize that here. If you wanna to uh, ask a question from the industry folks or from Ken um, or, or from the project team, put it in the chat, but we'll also um, you know give you an opportunity to, to ask it openly, turn on, turn on if you're mute at that point in time. And this is gonna be considered kind of an open session where we have that feedback and that discussion time together. Um, and then of course you can change your views, uh, upper right corner and just remember we're being recorded. So, um, you know, make sure that um, everything is uh, clean and audit worthy. So uh, we'll continue to move forward here. Um, as you can see, uh, we're in the second session at two o'clock to, to 3.30. Um, this is the session on connecting ports to the global uh, domestic trade. Um, this is a conversation with inland barge operators, and um, you know we just we just really want to uh, to welcome our panel. and And uh, there, there's been some changes based on on uh, current events, but I'll let uh, our moderator Ken Erickson kind of describe that as he goes through introductions of the panel. But originally, we had Marty Heddle from American Commercial Barge Line. Uh, operators and, and and Barry Gibson from James Marine, Duca, and also we have Steve Alley from uh, Ingram Barge Company, uh, based in the Nashville, Tennessee area. So um, we'll have a, a like I said, a, a time for there to be some questions and answers and and kind of a discussion format. Um, and and we'll definitely want to you know add into this discussion today a little bit about resiliency throughout the transportation industry. Um, Specifically with, with the waterway transportation, um, you know, since that's the, the the focus of our discussion. So, with that being said, um, and no further ado, I, I'd like to introduce Ken Erickson from IHS Market, um, and uh, he'll be our moderator. And uh, Ken, I'm handing it over to you. All right, thank you, Jimmy. And it's a privilege to be with everyone this afternoon on this third summit. 
and to be on this panel here, a, a conversation with the Inland Barge Operators. And uh, Steve, we're going to drop the S and make it singular and call it Barge Operator. And as Jimmy alluded to, we've got a bit of a situation in the U.S. Center Gulf with uh, Hurricane Ida when she came ashore and made a little bit of a turn towards the east and created a number of challenges around that. And we're going to spend a few minutes talking around that uh, with you, Steve. But first, uh, we'll go through a few uh, through a few introductions of ourselves. Um, if you wouldn't mind, Steve, go ahead and introduce yourself and Ingram Barge Lines to us as we'll kick off this uh, panel here this afternoon. Sure. Thanks again, Ken. Uh, my name is Steve Alley. I'm the Vice President of Sales for Ingram. I've been in the industry for almost 38 years um, with Ingram. Um, started out overhauling tow boats back in the mid 80s in engineering and designed a maintenance program for the boats and worked myself out of a job. And they said, go, go and talk to the VP of sales. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not a, not a sales guy, but <clears throat> apparently I was. So I've been doing that for the last 35 to the last 38 years. So um, Ingram is headquartered in Nashville. We have a, a huge presence on the inland waterway. We're the largest dry cargo carrier on the waterways. We have in excess of 4,000 barges and 150 towboats. Um, we've spent over $2 billion in the last 11 years replacing assets with new assets. Hopefully they're intact <laughs> in the Gulf right now. Um, the reason you're stuck with me, I can't be Marty. Uh, I know Marty well. He's uh, he's a DC guy for the industry, a uh, brilliant man. Um, I'm sure they're busy right now with saying the same problems we're all trying to deal with in the Gulf. But uh, Ingram's been through many a storm. Uh, we were involved in Katrina and many other ones uh, over the years. Um, right now, most of our team is in contact with our New Orleans people, our associates, to make sure everybody's safe. To my understanding, as of this morning's conference call, video call, uh, we have one person with a broken leg. Everybody else is sound and good to go, uh, you know, take care of their homes. So we're reallocating some people out of our Paducah operation um, to New Orleans to kind of take over and fill in down there. Um, we've been doing this business uh, since 1948. We're privately held. I'll give you a little history on Ingram if you... Uh, like soccer, we also own the Nashville Soccer Club, uh, professional soccer team, that's ours. We're building a $550 million soccer stadium for a team that plays 20 games a year. I don't get it, but it's none of my business. Apparently it's a big thing. And uh, we also do most of the backdoor business for Amazon, where it comes to books. We're the largest publisher in the United States. Uh, we do uh, soft print hard print, largest textbook supplier in the country. And for some silly reason, we're in the towboat business. So uh, started out doing it in the black oil business years ago under partnership with the Koch family. And uh, that got us in the barging side. We don't, I don't know today, we don't move any black oil because it's, it's too dangerous. So <laughs> funny how it got us started, but that's where we're at today. So um, that's a little bit about Ingram, a little bit about me. The reason you had me on the call was uh, I'm not that far away from retirement, so I get to stay back and take care of all these kind of things. So I'm also on the uh, Transportation Waterway Advisory Board to the governor's office. I'm one of the original members. I think Jeremy and I go back, uh, I don't know, eight or 10 years doing this. So we went through three governors already. So I don't think I want to do a fourth one. <laughs> well, Steve, we appreciate having you here today and your experience. Uh, uh, certainly is phenomenal for us to have on this panel. Uh, you being the singular person of the panel, but uh, you do, of course, have, as you said, Marty uh, is stellar and certainly Barry is as well. And Barry, uh, since his uh, reg regrets as well, he uh, messaged me and said that uh, his uh, company, they were able to find their dry dock towboat and some other barges, and they're now trying to figure out how they're going to get it back to where they need to be. So, um, similar stories. A lot of barges have been corralled. It's just a matter of getting them to the rightful owners in the Gulf <laughs> and yeah. making sure what cargo is in there, what condition it is uh, in the Gulf here as we go forward. You know, what's amazing in the industry, though, is, um, and I learned it very early on in my career, uh, very early on, like the third week I was employed, that uh, this industry works really close together. 
especially in times of need. If you have a breakaway on a waterway system, everybody jumps in and helps. Everybody jumps in and corrals barges and uh, they work together as a unit to protect the floating assets, but more so to protect the people. Um, you won't find an industry that's like that other than ours. Bills don't get traded off. You don't invoice people for your time. You just take it and you fix it and you move on because you could be the next one that needs help. And that's what we're seeing taking place right now in the Gulf. Everybody's pulling together, um, pulling barges off of, off of hillsides and out of trees and making sure things will float and um, getting them back to their proper uh, holding areas, their proper fleeting areas. So um, that's one of the fantastic things about being in the water business is on the, on the, the inland waterway system, that's the way they've always operated. And um, I don't ever see that changing. It's been that way my entire career. Well, I appreciate you saying that, Steve, because part of the description of this particular session is about gaining insight into the daily operations, challenges, future perspectives from the river. Uh, we couldn't get anything more um, real time from a daily operation and, and really challenges in the system uh, as they come forward here. And really the resiliency and I guess if you wouldn't mind, just give a sense because what happens in one part of the system really has that repercussions and ripple effects through the entire system. And, and we know that the center Gulf is very important for the inland river system. And then of course, for the inland river uh, uh, ports, especially, and those terminals that operate there, shippers that are trying to move cargo, there's a lot of signals that need to be sent. And understanding it. And it's not just then the shippers and, and the ports, but it's also, as we know from our clients as IHS market, our clients the world over, their question is, will, when will it open? And when will trades resume? And what can we expect? Or do we need to go someplace else in the world and find that opportunity for to fulfill the requirements they have? Because they can't wait, even though it takes 30 days, 60 days to get to their location, they got to start that that ripple effect someplace else around the world to start the process moving. And in this world, because so much is important to go through the Gulf, whether it's an import or an export, for you as an industry, and of course, speaking to Ingram, what did this look like in anticipating uh, Hurricane Ida? What would that planning and that day -to daily operations consideration look like as, as the storm was coming? How does that start to filter into your planning? Initially, uh, about five days as this thing was developing in the Gulf, our operating team got together, which they always do. We start looking at where are our floating assets, what is at risk, and what needs to be moved first. Um, we had some barges down at the mouth of the river um, that had to be pulled up immediately back into the waterway system. And, we're, and then the next thought is how do we get our assets in the safe, into the safest possible harbor. And what that means though, is that there are times like in Ingram's case and others in our industry, people take the risk and we put uh, men and women on our boats and they man these operations of these floating assets in the Gulf region. So we had boats on the West Canal, the East Canal, in New Orleans, at Laplace, where this thing hit pretty hard. Um, Algiers Point, where we saw it came through, if you watch the Weather Channel. And uh, we had floating, we had boats basically holding on to barges and people risking um, potentially their lives. Um, normally, because we did, the window is small. Normally, as you see these things developing out in the lower Atlantic, you have 10, 12, 14 days to react. Then when it gets into the Gulf, um, we all have pretty good models that we use to determine where it's going to come in at. Uh, you know, I turn, this thing took a direct turn north. If it would have went a little bit farther east, we would be talking about a different recovery plan. Uh, or farther west. This thing went far enough over Morgan City, far enough west, that it pushed water out of Lake Pontchartrain right up into the Gulf, right up into the river system. Some people are saying this is 10 times worse than Katrina. Uh, I would say if you lived in New Orleans through Katrina, you would disagree. But from an industry standpoint, where the damage is done at, this is no doubt um, probably worse effects on the industry just because of the way it came in and how it raised the water levels. I will, from a positive standpoint, the billions of dollars that was spent by the federal government to protect the levee systems, to raise those up and redirect that water. 
I would say from what I've been able to see so far, it's worked. Those levees didn't get breached. There was a minimal loss of life, um, minimal really loss of assets. Um, our first priority is always our people. And once we got people off the boats, we sent people down from Paducah, St. Louis and other areas that are in transit right now um, to get in there and replace those personnel today and go home and take care of their families and their, their own, their homes and things of that nature. So power is a big problem right now. Um, we still have VHF and single sideband radios and the old fashioned way to communicate and uh, the telephone, analog phones uh, are, are working. The internet's a mess right now. So uh, we're not really relying on that, but um, what I've, what I've seen, even if you go out on Facebook, you know, there's a lot of river industry pages you can belong to out there. The people that are pulling together always pull together. And how that affects up river shippers, I'll give you an example. We as an industry have to declare a big word called force majeure, which means we can't operate. We're, we're, we're not even allowed in a harbor. So if you have vessels coming in that are in the Gulf, they're not coming in to, they're not going to come into a, into a port. Uh, we know that some of the rigs that do the discharging in this particular case have flipped. Uh, so they're not, they have to be raised and, and, and repaired. So, um, so if you have imports coming in, they're in the Gulf, uh, you know, you're probably best leaving them there. It's hard to, hard to redirect a vessel that's already waiting to come in the pass. If you have export business and you're trying to ship southbound out of the lower Ohio or out of one of the, one of the docks, one of the state docks in Kentucky, um, we're probably not going to load right now for at least a few days. We can get a handle. I know we won't. We get a handle on what's going on in the Gulf. Um, if there's even a safe berth to take load. Nobody wants to take barges south and then have them sit. We're not as concerned about future storms as we are about protecting the customer's product. The timing is not great. It looks like there was going to be an early harvest on the lower Miss and the lower Ohio Valley. So I'm sure our, our docks and that have been ramping up for some corn and soybeans to ship, but if there's not a vessel to put those in or, or anchorage or facility to work them in the Gulf, that corn may have to sit a little bit longer. But that's a little early to say at this point, you know, we're only 48 hours into the program. I will say that if it can be fixed in rapid fashion, this industry has proven in the past that they can do that. Where there's a will, they will find a way to move freight. But right now, we are telling our southbound shippers, sorry, you got to stop loading until we figure out what's going on. And the same thing for the northbound accounts. You have to, you can't get into the harbor. So nothing's going to pick up, nothing's going to move for at least, uh, we're guessing at this point. Some guys, some people are saying six weeks, some are saying a week. We'll, we'll move when the Corps of Engineers and the Coast Guard say we can move. <laughs> and not a minute. What? Well, Steve, you bring up uh, uh, those, the Coast Guard and the uh, Army Corps engineers, and I'd be curious to understand how the industry works with these two organizations. What is required here? What does this mean? Because that, that's important for upriver lo loading and, and receiving of cargoes. How, how important is and how closely does the industry work with the Coast Guard and the Army Corps engineers during things like this? I would say when I started 38 years ago, not so well. Um, but over the last 10 years, through a lot of work on the part of um, the industry and uh, the private and public sector, states getting involved, uh, DC getting involved, um, us being, in, being able to have more say on how monies that we pay and in, 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 uh, user staff have spent, it's brought the industry closer together with both the core and the Coast Guard. And they work in collaboration multiple times a day on video conferencing to work towards resolution. They take the lead in a situation like this. So they tell us when we can and can't get in. We are a priority uh, um, companies. So we do get to get into the devastated areas, check on assets and get people going. So uh, the Port of South Louisiana and all the other ports, they work hand in hand with the core around the clock right now. These conversations are taking place before the storm hit. And I know that our um, senior vice president of ops did not sleep the other night. I was on a conference call with him yesterday morning and um, he sounded exhausted. Um, so the conversations take place continually in a situation like this, as opposed to a 
a lot going down or something like that. When a situation like this occurs, uh, all hands are on deck and even people that don't and get involved in operations, but may have operating background, they're in it, their boots are on. And they said, you know, button up and head to, head to New Orleans and start dispatching or swinging ropes, I would do it. That's the way the industry works. So, uh, but the Corps of the Coast Guard in the last 10 years in the industry have gotten much closer together working to, to work towards solutions that, that benefit everybody. Yeah, and so Steve, with that, the Coast Guard is the one that kind of takes point in this type of situation. Then, and they will, the as far as that's concerned, the Corps will be checking levees, checking uh, breaches, um, out on assets with us. Private uh, surveyors will be out. You'll see drones. So the, you know, the new technology of the drone is pretty impressive. We didn't have that at Katrina per se, so uh, there are drones out. There are drones out immediately yesterday. Um, flying over the waterway system, they can send a continual video back to the federal government and to the industry. Uh, mostly concerned initially first with personnel and then um, cargoes that could be more dangerous than others to tag them, identify where they're at, and if need be, get bodies on them. Uh, but yeah, the Coast Guard will take the lead and then the Corps will be more concerned with um, from, from my background in it, with the assets and where they're at, and are, can they cause a problem at this point? And is there something that we, we all need to be aware of that gets fixed first? And then they prioritize all of that. And hopefully within a week or 10 days, the river comes back to where it needs to be and we get our anchorages back and some barges uh, get drug out of fields and or they just get cut up. That, that does happen too. No, it is it's quite remarkable. And to be able to use those drones and now other technology associated with uh, the drones and such, boy, the instant uh, viewing that we can have and, and then the get into locations you couldn't otherwise and with the speed and uh, flexibility and really protecting human life too. And, and I guess the other side of it is make sure you get enough power to uh, recharge these uh, units. That's going to be the next problem because power is the big issue uh, down in, in the center Gulf right now. Yeah, there is um, a lot of people uh, there, including us. We have a lot of generator power uh, that we can bring in. Um, if we think this is extended, we have floating facilities we can have in New Orleans in six to seven days with living quarters, water, fuel, generator power. All the boats have generators on them, so you have electrical power there. Our shoreside facilities can run the generators as well. Uh, it's not getting to them, uh, but you're right. If, if you're an independent drone operator uh, who's working out of your house, you don't have electricity right now, unless you have unless you have a generator uh, and the fuel to make that generator work. Um, but I was shocked how fast video was coming in, drone video of the above New Orleans up through Baton Rouge waterway system. Um, so it's so clear that you can actually see barge numbers on the side of barges. Hmm. Well, and hopefully that helps them pinpointing, uh, geocoding those and be able to get to your assets much quicker than. It does. And, it's exactly what it does. Yeah. Well, that's going to be the thing is just the resiliency of the system. It, as an industry, you've been through a number of events and every event is uh, its own event. And there's no, there's, there's a lot of planning, but you can't plan for everything until no, it happens. You don't, it's, everything's reactionary. Um, they didn't, it didn't go far enough west of the, for instance, the salt mines didn't get affected this time. Earlier this year, they got they got nailed a couple different times because of the, the storms that came through. They got hit hard last year, so you just don't know. And this thing you can't really tell if it's coming in. If it turns two or three degrees right or left or goes straight, usually it comes in at an angle. This thing turned and came straight up. And the more I watched it the other morning, um, you know, I've been in this business thirty almost thirty years. So is my wife. And she said, "There's that doesn't look good." <laughs> Not, nothing good about that coming up. And when you see the river to the east of the storm, there's nothing good about that. So I understand why the rest of the team couldn't be on the call today. Um, there are people still looking for employees. Uh, we've, as I said earlier, we know where all of ours are. Some have lost homes. Uh, a lot of them have fishing camps down along the Gulf Shore. Those are gone. It's also a video of one of my friend of ours who works for me. She's, her camp is destroyed. So, but that, that's just a camp. You know, that can be replaced. This is, this is about people and about keeping people employed and 
the industry, as I said, has always amazed me how they work together um, in situations, whether it's a breakaway at a, at a locking river or a catastrophic event taking place in the Gulf of Mexico. It's just, it, it's not like any other industry. And I've worked in a few of them before I got involved in this one. Well, uh, it, it's, it is so true. And we think, though, about this industry and we think about the commodities that flow through the system here. And when you're looking at northwards of almost or almost 500 million tons of cargo a year, uh, the uh, billions of ton miles that are generated, uh, you guys uh, as Ingram represent the largest share of the barge fleet, uh, just over 4,000, and there's 22,400 assets that uh, are used in the inland navigation industry. And by the way, thank you for participating in our annual survey that we conduct with the barge fleet profile, but it is remarkable. It looks like we may have lost a few uh, <laughs> scratch off the, the record for next year, but end of the day, you, you talked about jobs, and, and these are commodities that are moving in these barges. Uh, there's there's uh, deckhands, there's uh, um, uh, pilots and there's captains and, and there's a whole host of others, uh, cr other crew members, not to mention the, the team that supports uh, elsewhere. And there's a lot of labor that goes into this, but then it's the, the, the tentacles that go up the river system, some 12,000 miles of it that we've got that hit all these individual uh, areas in the states. Uh, it gets to be important and the commodities that need to flow because right now we've got an export elevator uh, there at reserve that represents roughly uh, eight to uh, twelve percent of capacity in the Gulf, and that's not any small volume. That's a very large facility that's going to be down for a long time, and others that don't have power, people can't get there. So to your point, immediately at events like this, you get shut down, no loading up river because you don't know what's going to happen when things will be reopening. But boy, when the gates reopen. Uh, <laughs> We hope that the cargo is still there and didn't either two things. One, that it didn't divert to another mode, which is what we're hearing for one elevator. They're trying to move to their elevator in the Pacific Northwest, but I can be watching very closely the secondary car uh, rates this week. But at the same time, the competitors will try to come in and take advantage of this. It's not that they're taking advantage of it. It's just the market cries for in price. Price will tell the story and you got to follow the money in this case. And and when these events happen, other markets start to open up because they've got availability. And that's the, as you guys know, as an industry, trying to be as resilient and, and do it as safely as possible uh, because it's about long-term competitiveness that gets to be important in this. Well, even, even this year, we saw a major uptick in export coal coming out of the mines of Kentucky. And we, we didn't budget that. We didn't forecast for that. There's a lot of stone coming out of the Kentucky quarries and mines as well that's going down to these LNG projects in, in the Gulf. We did know about those. We did kind of plan around those. And, and uh, of course, those projects are all stopped. So the stone that, was, that we were loading, we had rigs um, around Copper City that we were, we were loading a rock to go to the Gulf. And uh, that stuff's all stopped right now. So, uh, but we, like, the, like every other industry, we've had a difficult time finding good quality help. And there is, a, there is an employee shortage problem going on right now in the country as well. So part of our issue is incentivizing uh, deckhands to stay on board and stay, and stay, you know, stay at work. We have 110,000 um, jobs in the state of Kentucky that are all that's tied to the waterway system. Uh, and, that's that, and that's a pretty steady number. It goes up, it goes down a little bit, but it stays right around 110,000 jobs. You know, $1.2 billion dollars and state and local tax revenue is generated. And we have, we have hundreds of people that, at our company alone that live and work in Paducah. Most of our operations, when, you, when we crew and decrew boats, takes place in the Paducah, Columbus, Kentucky area. Our largest uh, fleeting area for the entire company is in, is in Columbus, down at the mouth of the, of the river. And we have operations in Silver Grove and a sales office in Northern Kentucky. And it's, um, it's difficult to to not to hire right now because you can go to work at you know at, at an air conditioned factory making twenty five bucks an hour, but in our industry it's tough work. You're out working on boats and barges, and you're in the heat, and you're in the elements, and you're in the snow. And but the good thing is you come to work for the our industry. You work six months, thirty on, thirty off. And if you can get if you if you like that lifestyle, you get used to that lifestyle. It's a great career. We have a lot of uh, guys that are senior, our president and CEO, he came off the boats. I mean, 
that's the way you can work your way up if, if you're if you're motivated enough to do that. You know, the income that's generated just for the state alone for our industry is six billion dollars. Um, Thirty billion dollars in total output. I mean, the river. There's fifteen hundred and ninety miles of waterways that touch Kentucky. Kentucky's the fourth largest waterway attachment in the nation. Um, that's why I'm on one of the advisory boards with the governor. Is there's a huge amount of business that takes place in our ports, and we should be grateful that the state of Kentucky has eleven public ports. Most states don't have public ports. They have a lot of private ports. A lot of industry got people that need to do it themselves. It's rare to have 11 public ports in a state. We also have the advantage of using, utilizing the Tennessee Town Baby Waterway. A lot of other states can't do that. Kentucky can turn to Paducah, go down a, you know, a couple hundred miles and head down to Tentown. That's why our governor is on the, the Tennessee Town Baby Waterway Advisory Council. There's Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi. Those four states control uh, that river. Now, is that river important? It's real important today. A whole lot more important than it was a week ago, maybe. Um, so we're always looking at that. And when you look at strictly at utilities, you know, 37, 38% of the total inbound of the utilities moves on the water. Mining, outbound, like 28, 30%. Crop production by water. Minimally, it's 20%. Can't be as high as 40% for the state. And of course, chemicals are 18% of the, of the business. And as the state of Kentucky continues to be open to industry, um, Nucor Steel is building another mill in Brandenburg, Kentucky. Um, that'll employ hundreds of people. Right now, it's employing thousands because they're building it. But that facility will generate uh, you know, another 1.5 million tons of, of uh, finished steel that'll go all over, all over the world, produced in the lovely state of Kentucky. The mill they have in, in Gent, Kentucky is just double production in the last 15 months. Uh, that steel is going, that steel is literally going everywhere in the world. So the impact of the waterways on the state is massive. And that's why so many companies have operating headquarters in the state of Kentucky, in the Paducah area, is because that's that's where it takes place at. That's where where the activity is at. And it's a turning point for most every large carrier is the mouth of the river where everything meets. So, hey, hey, Steve, if, if I could stop you there for a moment, because I've been wanting to get to that Paducah point there. It's, it's very important where if you could speak to the rivers that are coming there. So we've got two major rivers. I'll let you explain that. And, and how Paducah sets up and really for, as you've referenced, that you've got an uh, operation there in Paducah. And what is it that's important for uh, Ingram to have operations there? And, and how does that really fit in tie? And as we start to unravel this, because you've given me a lot of qu questions and many others. We've got a couple other questions on here. But speak to the P Paducah. What are those rivers coming together? And we're, what does this really mean? We're in Paducah and Columbus. So Paducah to the farthest western point of the state. You have the upper Mississippi hitting the lower Mississippi, and the Ohio comes in right there as well. At Paducah, you have the Cumberland River, the Tennessee River, and the Ohio River all meeting in, in, in the greater Paducah area. So everything that flows in and out of Tennessee, uh, the east coming to the west, uh, that feeds the power plants above Nashville, uh, that all flows through Paducah. At Columbus, which is where the river's where everything kind of points at right there, it's it's very wide and it's massive. And it's, it's kind of like a big, huge parking lot um, where you bring in all these barges. So we'll, we'll run up the lower miss and down the lower miss with 30 to 40 barges at a time. And so Steve, what kind of horsepower units are you using on that part of the river between then? Between 7,800 and 10,500 horsepower boats. Those boats that run that region, they don't have to go through locks. Once you get below St. Louis, all the way to the north, to the Gulf, there's no lock. It's, it's a wide open river, just like it, back, it was like it was back in the day when Mark Twain was riding paddle wheelers. <laughs> it's the same river system. It's wild and it's open and and it, it raises and it falls and it's it's it can be it can be a heck of a ride to go to go up and down it. So those boats are big, and those boats push as many as there's pictures of boats pushing 70, 80 barges, but generally. 
35 to 40 barges at a time, sometimes 45 at the river's right. But once you get under the Ohio, the Tennessee, the Cumberland, the Upper Miss, where there's locking rivers, you step down to a 15 barge tow. So this big parking lot in the Columbus Paducah area is where all these bigger tows get broken into smaller tows for imports, stuff going north. And then the stuff that goes to the export market goes down in these smaller 12 to 15 barge tows. There they get built into these larger tows that go to the Gulf for the export market or potentially to the domestic market, but it's in, it's in the Gulf. So the same boat that runs from the Paducah Columbus to the Gulf is not the same boat that runs on the Ohio. Those boats range as small as some guys run 18 to 2100 horsepower boats. We like to run the 5600s. They're bigger, they're beefier. Uh, that's just our preference. 4800 to 5600 on the Ohio. Similar boats on the Illinois and the Upper Miss. Smaller boats on the Cumberland. Um, Tennessee, a little bit smaller, but similar size. They can, they can push 15 barge toes. And then down to 10 time, if you use that as an option, it's a smaller boat that pushes, uh, well, six to 12, depending upon the carrier. And then you have the Green River that runs into Kentucky as well. There's business that's done up there and that's all done um, out of the mouth of the Kentucky, uh, out of the mouth of the Ohio as well in the Green. And that's, they run four to six bar toes up there. So the tow configurations are all over the board, but this massive area where that's why Paducah is so critical is it's wide and it's where everything comes together and everybody does. And we also have a major, well, the James the earlier, when you know, our buddy from James had to drop off. We have a major repair facility in Paducah. Our engineering group is in Paducah. Our parts and warehousing operations in Paducah and our, our operating entity all runs out of our Paducah yard. So uh, our, all of our um, deckhand training is all done in Paducah. Uh, we need a bigger airport there for sure, but that's for another discussion. <laughs> you can't get there real easy, actually, other than by, by driving it. <laughs> that is true, but it is, once you're there, it's a good place to be, that's for yeah. sure. And, and so, Steve, I think about those barge tows are coming together, so 15 off the Ohio River and the other tributaries coming to Paducah, you're putting, say, two, maybe three of those together. Uh, you're pushing over 60,000 tons of cargo, that's as much volume as would go into one ship in the Gulf. So yeah. assembling that amount of volume is very important when we think about the scale that we've got in the system then. Yeah, well, you'll run 22,000 to 25,000 uh, tons of cargo on the Ohio River with a 15 barge tow, depending upon the water levels and how deep we can get them loaded. And uh, there's a slide that's been, I don't even, even think I have it anymore. It's been going around for years. Uh, but there it is. All right, it's uh, 1,050 trucks, 216 rail cars is one tow of barges on the Ohio. Years ago, when uh, President when Clinton was president, uh, he wanted to enact a, a dollar per gallon tax on our industry to help pay for the locks and dams. We weren't opposed to paying more, but he would have literally shut down uh, some river areas like the Upper Ohio and the Upper Miss. So we went out and had a lot of meetings out in cornfields and barns and and uh, showed these showed these particular slides and said you know it's when you do the math if you have 15 toes running past uh, Louisville a day for instance 15 times 216 you can do the math you've got 3,000 to 4,000 more trucks a day on I-71, I-65, and I-64. That's a massive amount of additional truck traffic. What does that do to accidents, to vehicles, to emissions? You know, when you start looking at um, how green industries are, uh, are um, and you start looking at CO2 emissions, hands down, nobody touches the barging business. And the CO2 emission um, for truck is 154.2 million or the, yeah, the measuring you usually use for millions, millions of ton miles. And then in rail, it's like 21. In barge, it's 15.6. I think Ingram's number right now, because we're doing some interesting things with engines, and, and uh, I think we're down to around 13 point something. So, but the other, the industry's coming there as well. Uh, there's a but huge it, advantage to the waterway that Kentucky enjoys 
because it's also the least expensive way to move freight. Yeah, and Steve, you make a good point. And uh, tomorrow there's a commodities panel first thing in the morning. And um, I see Adams is on here. He's going to be on that for the uh, Kentucky Corn Growers Association. And, and there's another gentleman, Mike Cohen, with, with uh, um, the, from the aluminum sector. And one thing that Mike has uh, talked about uh, on our pre-calls was about the sustainability. And sustainability is everything. And as an aluminum user and consumer, uh, they pay very close attention. He says that the river system, the waterway system is a natural way for us to reduce that, be more sustainable and use, have a much smaller carbon footprint. And what you're saying is very important. And in this environment where we are today, this is one of those stories that can't be told enough about how sustainable you are. Well, you can even take it to another level of sustainability when it comes to other cars. It's not just dry bulk. There's liquids, there's liquid chemicals as well to move on the waterway system and the, the safest way to move a liquid is by pipeline. <laughs> the second way to move it is by barge. Um, the absolute worst way to move it is by truck. I don't know if there's truckers on this call or not, but uh, and it's not necessarily because of the truck being the problem, it's everybody else that gets in our way. So when you talk about um, sustainability and reducing your carbon footprint, and we do a lot of that in our, in in our company and in our, in, our, in our industry as well, um, it's a driver in our company in every senior meeting as part of discussions with the operating group, how to continue to reduce our footprint and leave, leave the world a better place, um, which makes us proud to be in our industry. Liquids uh, barging in and of itself, there's just some products you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to risk putting on a truck or a train. And we, we've seen that happen in the past where a train comes through a little community and derails and Bam, we got a major problem with, uh, with emissions in the air and, and people losing, losing homes and other issues that come from it. So it's not just a, it's not just a dry cargo issue, it's also a liquids barging issue as well. Well, and that's a great point because that comes into, it, it, you don't have the spills, you don't have the, the punctures, you don't have, it, it's just so rare that you have any kind of emissions or, or, or just from your liquid cargoes. And liquid cargoes, that's 170, 180 million tons a year moving on the inland waterways. And that's, those are, as you <coughs> mentioned already, chemicals to uh, jet fuel to the um, additives that go into um, de-icing for aircraft in different areas or for uh, roadways and such. So that liquid cargo side, and we just had uh, a, a question from, or uh, Bill Kinsler encouraging us right on cue to talk about the liquid side, but there's benefits in a number of different ways, not only to be efficient, but to be safe and, and to really be low cost and, and moving products in. Precisely, Bill actually is probably doing this a, a year or two longer than I have. <laughs> <laughs> We should have Bill sign on here. Well, and Bill's great. And uh, we've had some meetings with him as part of this project. And, and as we, we go back and we've, we've met with uh, the, in the different areas, the 11 ports, river ports that form the Kentucky Republic Port uh, Network and, and met with all the great uh, river port directors and many shippers along the way. Uh, they're constantly looking for ways to uh, bring attraction to the river ports and what it means to be able to come through and use these river ports. As you think about, you know, the types of investment that's required in this industry, and we think about how long this industry has been around and, and where the, in, where the infra investment was made, say, not just years ago, but decades ago, where do you see the investment needing to go forward here in the environment that we are today, the types of commodities, the shifts that have gone on with coal? And I think your, your company knows that all too well, unfortunately, as many others have just not you as a, a, a operator, but many. What are those things that need to be done to try to keep the resiliency on the on the river port side for types of investment that would be required? Well, the, the first thing is we have to keep the locks and dams operational. Um, and we do that um, by spending a lot of time in DC. Uh, we have agreed and in fact do pay a higher user's tax right now. Um, we offered to do that under a prior administration and it was turned down. But right now we are paying more money because we want to have a say in how it's spent and where it goes. Uh, I'd say for years, uh, the big push was the Ohio River because of all the coal. Uh, that's coal is no longer king, as much as I hate to say that. In our industry, it's gone from, from our company from 60, 65% down to the 20s. 
it might be a little higher this year with export picking up. Um, but Kentucky is in a phenomenal state uh, location just because of all the other industry that, that's here and the other products that move on a waterway system through the state of Kentucky. Um, that they're they're positioned in a amazing location. And what, what I mean by that is the public terminals have an advantage over other states in that we have an economic development team in Frankfurt and we have the ports in the state of Kentucky. Those two working together, I believe can do some amazing things for this state. Those two working together, because you know, when you have some, we have property in our state that is, is uh, available for economic development. Not many states that can touch the waterway system have that. We just need to make sure that our economic development team is in constant communication with the port directors because you have an asset in these port directors that most other states don't have. Alabama has it, but they're kind of done at this point. Tennessee doesn't have it. Um, Illinois doesn't have it. Ohio doesn't have it. West Virginia doesn't have it, but Kentucky does. And as long as our economic development group is uh, sharing uh, intelligence with the port directors in a confidential uh, way, they're all, you know, they're all poised to state. And by working together, um, I think the, the growth opportunity for the state of Kentucky is in comparison to other states around us is untouchable. Yeah, and if you would, if, I'm going to ask probably a loaded question here, Steve. You talked about sharing information and and confidentially, but what kind of information, if you could just speak to diff different times information, would be important? Do you think from uh, economic development, river port directors, the waterway uh, operators, river operators, towboat operators, and others? What does that look like that uh, would be necessary? Would you, do you think you're doing it today? I can tell you that under the prior administration in Frankfurt. I met with the governor um, and in dialogue, I congratulated him on getting the new core deal done. I said, but you made a big mistake. I was helping your economic development team put this package together. I didn't know who the customer was, but I knew what was going on. Not once was there a dialogue between economic development and port, the port directors. I think that's a big reason why this was taking place today because now they are talking. And they have an advantage to communicate with one another that, hey, let's let the state necessarily then come to the, come somewhere where we already have property. Or if you're not, like in Brandenburg, as I told the prior governor, build it yourself. Let the Port of Louisville run it. Because it's, it's literally right down the river. Um, there's, just, there's just other ways to do it. That now I think that's, that that's happening in, in the state of Kentucky. And it makes me happy to see this going on because I want to see our state thrive and survive. I'm in the northern part of the state. You know, up in, I'm, in, I'm in Boone County. Um, we, have a, we have a port up here that doesn't even exist. It's in, it's in name only. But nonetheless, there's opportunity throughout the entire state to touch the waterways. And by having economic development talking to the port directors and working in unison, when these opportunities come on board and they're, and, and they're communicating, the opportunity then to bring the industry into it in a confidential mode as well is, has really changed in the last couple of years in the state. So my hat's off to whoever's doing it, whoever's steering it and driving it, kudos to you, because it's, uh, I think some other states are a little concerned. Indiana has a pretty robust program, but it's not, they don't have the same opportunity that the state of Kentucky has. So uh, we're sitting in a fantastic location there's a lot of property too down into just west of Paducah that's been talked about for years. I think in the next three to five years, somebody's going to sneak in there and the state's going to be uh, in a phenomenal location to get involved in that as well. So it's right, it's right on the water. So Steve, as you're uh, involved in sales and, and you're trying to help a shipper uh, and, and you're, you're part problem solver, <laughs> uh, and, and these river port directors are also problem solvers trying to help with people and you're looking to help bring someone through and you think you could be doing something, you've got your, you could really accommodate with the way your fleet structured, the way the system comes together. 
but it's missing a, a particular Riverport area. Uh, take any one of them, and it needs some sort of investment to accommodate them. What does that look like to try to get some investment for that? Or do you come across that? Is that a challenge? Or how do uh, river ports try to prepare themselves or the state of Kentucky for forthcoming uh, opportunities in the future here? It, it, it can be a challenge if you, if you to get monies from the, the industry, like for instance, Ingram, if the opportunity presented itself, um, we would invest. We would invest in assets, uh, shore side assets, cranes, people, you know, property. Um, but there are many opportunities to bring business through the existing terminals in the state of Kentucky that are run by the state, not by the state. And what I'll do in cases where a, a cold call or a call comes in on somebody who wants to move product into Kentucky and they don't know what they're doing and they don't know where to go with it, rather than recreate and rebuild something out of scratch, my first referral to them is where you're going as an end user how, how close can we get it to a port? And let's get, let's get you in touch with the port director and, and let you guys work out a deal to bring it to an existing port. Um, I think if our ports were overwhelmed, it shouldn't be hard to get more money. <laughs> <to make it laughs> they don't do it for costs. I mean, <laughs> they're a profit center. <laughs> for sure. Well, it, this, this uh, switch to another, there's a question that came up in the chat here around um, possible and this is a, a, a discussion that's been going on for many years and i know from experience working with ingram and others but uh speaking to container on barge what could be those opportunities uh to change some of the types of commodities or the way that commodities are moved on the river system this is a, a multimodal intermodal move what what do it, you guys see around that it's already happening um we have a we as an as a company have a move right now um, we've uh, kind of changed our business model a little bit in Ingram. We have a, a division now called Ingram Logistical Services or ILS. And that company is to do just that. Container is one piece of it, but uh, to be an international logistics company is the other leg. So if it means building a facility for a customer or taking your product from um, uh, Louisville, New from Newport, Kentucky to China. We'll put the whole package together and, and we'll build that whole thing out for you. Um, container on barge, we've, we've invested heavily in that mode right now. And we're doing containers. We're actually doing containers internationally. We're taking ownership of, of, of product in the in, uh, Middle East and bringing it into a destination in the, in the United States. So we're doing it all. We're gonna we own the, we're leasing the containers, leasing space of the vessels, bringing the product in, putting it in barges, midstreaming it, and then moving it up uh, and uh, up into the into the valley actually, in the Northern Kentucky area. We um, I, I think the container opportunities at, right now is a little difficult because container values have gotten crazy expensive. I mean, international shipping is expensive. A container that you used to be able to buy just three years ago. And we were doing a container move out of Chicago three years ago on Christmas Eve. A bunch of us were up there and it was like you know, eight below zero in Chicago. And we had a barge load of containers and uh, the guys said, yeah, you can buy these for 1800 bucks a piece. Well, those are probably $18,000 a piece right now. If you can even find a container. So well, I think once this settles down a little bit, uh, we should have more opportunity but we're in it right now. Uh, Anger was doing it. We're not the only ones doing it. There's there's containers moving right now, mostly empty containers to get back to the Gulf to get back to their or to, to their origin. Um, steel prices are expensive today. Uh, a new barge is nine hundred. Just a regular dry cargo barge is nine hundred thousand bucks. <sighs> not a lot. Not a lot of people building those, which I think that means we're going to see end up we'll end up seeing a smaller industry fleet. Because they're also paying at a really high price to uh, buy scrap barges, so I think in the, for the first time in my career, I will see a dry cargo fleet drop below seventeen thousand four hundred barges in this rewind. That's going to be remarkable. And we think about the ability to build new equipment. You're limited. You, you've got a couple builders, and really, there's one larger one and a smaller one. The uh, former bigger one is no more. No, it's been a great challenge. That company's gone, and um, you can build. I mean, if you want to spend 
<clears throat> you know, a million dollars to build a covered barge. I don't know if you're going to get your return back on it. This you build up the last 40 years. Uh, it's, 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 that's a tough decision to make. Um, so I, I think there'll be less nodding of the head to build, but more on nodding of the head to scrap. Because you can you can look at a barge and think it's going to cost me fifty to eighty grand a year to repair it, an open barge, or I can scrap it for seventy five to hundred thousand dollars and take the cash. Um, you'll see the cash, and that's not even talking about uh, that's just barges, liquid barges, tank barges are a lot more expensive to build. Um, we're the first time in the history in in my history, are building towboats for the first time. Um, they're smaller boats to run the canal, but we're building them. We've, we've launched two. We're going to build some more. Um, used to be, I mean, if I remember this right, a million dollars per thousand horsepower to build a boat when I started. It's not even close to that anymore. It's got to be three million. It, Bill saying uh, 12,000, 12 million for a 6,000 horsepower boat it's here in the chat. All right, so two, 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 two million. Two, all right, now yeah, it's about right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I would have thought a little higher with all the new technologies. But so you look at that. <laughs> I don't think we're we're short horsepower in the industry. I think we're uh, there may be some modes or you know, some some range of horsepower where there might be a bigger demand or a bigger need. But overall, I think the industry has enough horsepower. But when those barges disappear and there's nowhere to put that freight, um, it just makes for a tighter supply side on the, on the supply demand curve. If I think about looking, staying on the equipment side of things and, and trying to make the connection to uh, the, the coming to a river port, to a terminal, uh, some shippers, especially on the liquid side, have a concern with vetting barges on the age of the equipment, its condition. And we've seen it on the dry side, they've gotten a little bit older here recently. And on the tank side, they're staying around the 15 year range on average. The, the dry is getting to be over 16 years now, up a couple of years over the last couple of years. And what does that mean for uh, uh, the age of the equipment and a terminal or a port operator? How much should a river port really worry about the, the assets that are out there floating? Um, they should. We have some customers that won't even let you quote on their business if you're going to put assets in there that are 20 years old or older. Uh, mostly on the dry side. Liquids, it's even less than that. Uh, although liquid barges are maintained, I would say generally better than dry cargo barges are, because there's just more requirements from, the, from a shipper standpoint on those liquid barges. Of course, they all have to be double skinned anymore, but which means you have two walls and an airspace in between them. It's like a box in a box. That's why they float. Um, dry cargo wise, um, you better be investing in pumps. Because uh, we have a, we have a, there's a lot, there's an older fleet. I, I will say I, I, in Ingram's defense, people much smarter than me spent uh, a couple of billion dollars over the last 12 years building new barges. And I, I, I was arguing it the whole time saying it didn't make any sense to me, but our average cost per barge is a lot less than it costs today. And our fleet is one of the youngest, if not the youngest uh, fleets in the industry right now. So, um, it's an expensive business to get in. And unless there's some federal tax benefit, I can't see a lot of uh, bankers or lawyers or Indian chiefs building them. <laughs> well, that, that's gonna be the challenge. And I think then to that point, if we think about the challenges with um, the facilities and having a, a smaller fleet that we could be seeing, and, and the need to have as quick of turning that barge at a facility, if you look across the Kentucky River ports, how would you say that the, the equipment's adequate to be able to meet the demand and be efficient to load quickly, to turn those barges and those assets as quickly as possible? Is it well situated? Is there a lot of room for development or is it that we've changed eras and the types of commodities that we need to look at different infrastructure or different equipment? Um. Equipment wise, I'm a bulk cargo is bulk cargo. But what you're seeing happening is where before a carrier would leave New Orleans with a 40 barge tow. And they'll drop barges in Vicksburg, Greenville, Memphis, Hickman, Blytheville, um, and get up to 
Columbus with uh, something that looks totally different than what they left um, New Orleans with. It'd be a combination of, of, of empties, reloaded barges. What, you're, what we're starting to see now is they'll do that with one or two toes, like we will, but then we'll run um, smart toes, which run a full tow of loads into Columbus, out of New Orleans. They'll stop it all. They run straight through, there's no delays. The, the downside of that is we'll pick up, we'll pick up 15 of those, bring them in to the Port of Owensboro and drop 15 loads with nothing to pick up. So the push will start to become from a logistical standpoint that um, there'll be more pressure put on the ports to turn the asset over quicker. Uh, I think that's coming as the fleets get tighter and tighter, those, and, and that, that pressure will be put on the customer, not so much on the port. And then they'll, they'll be putting the pressure on the ports, prioritize discharge, working overtime and things like that. So ultimately that, that, that burden will fall on the shipper. Yeah. And, and, and if I take it even a step further and think about the multimodal connectivity at the river ports, um, Describe for us what that what you think around that. What are you seeing as if you think about the whole system that you operate within, but within Kentucky, whether it's rail or it's a highway or well, it's a, a, different ways. Um, we're we're actually doing business right now with people we were, we weren't doing business with three years ago that are building um, cars and refrigerators and making parts for vehicles and airplanes, and um, they bring stuff in right now. It sits in a warehouse, they use it as they need it, unless you're a chip manufacturer, then you're in high demand. But um, we have found that some of these partners, um, they're gonna float inventory, they're gonna have inventory anyway. And they're actually doing some just in time type stuff by water and using the barge as a warehouse. I got a deal right now, the first one we just did recently, we're bringing, um, paper waste into Kentucky and offloading it to truck and trucking it into Ohio. And they're turning it into cardboard because there's such a demand for cardboard right now by Amazon because every buyer thing online and we went up there the next day in our little brown box. And uh, this company's found a market and they're the first company right now that's actually using the river and we just did a barge last week. So if, if, if it works like it did last week, this could turn into a 500,000 ton a year business, a more business coming into the state of Kentucky. And the paper that's, comes from other places. This, that's impressive. And it's that full, again, that sustainability aspect that can be written here. And we go back earlier in the conversation. If I go back to an earlier question uh, from Bill Miller about um, moving those smaller commodity items. And I think this fits in really well. Think about 10 truckloads of coil. How do they compete with freight rates, rail and truck modes? And it's not, it's probably not just the rate we need to think about here, but what does that look like to try to compete on those smaller cargoes that you're trying to work on? Right now, if you are a, um, in the steel stack sector, if you need five coils, you're going to pay whatever truck rate you have to pay to get it moved. Um, we've been talking to some of the mills and in fact, have done some integrated moves recently where they might have five customers on the same barge. That's never happened before. That's never happened. It's always been this coil or this steel or this widget goes to that customer. And um, they would prefer from a manufacturer standpoint to not have all the trucks. It's not, it, it, it's a pain for them to have to have all these trucks. They'd rather just take it to the river, get, get their inventory built up there, load the barge and we go. And as long as we can reach certain thresholds on delivery time frames which I will admit is difficult when you're dealing with mother nature and the waterways, if it's a reasonable bracket of time and their partners can buy into it, they can save themselves a bunch of money in transportation costs, especially if your customer, if their customer is gonna warehouse it anyway, that getting away from that comfort that I have it sitting here next door is a little bit different than, hey, I have it sitting 300 miles away and it's still floating up here. It'll be here in three days. That causes some unrest for some people. But from a bottom line standpoint, it certainly is economical to make that decision and take the pain that goes with it. 
So some of that's happening, and I think we'll see more and more of that. Um, more from the supplier standpoint than from the end user standpoint. If you're the end user and you're controlling it and you want those five coils or those five plates of steel or those five I beams or that 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 you know truckload of widgets, you don't care. The transportation is not the cost. That's not your concern. It's getting that product out the door. So those people you're not going to change, but we're moving, you know, we're all rubber as an example. Rubber comes into the US from Malaysia to the port of New Orleans. Comes up here all across the state of Kentucky. And I will say the, first, the, state, the state of Kentucky was a manufacturer, was the first company in the history of the movement of raw rubber by barge. And we bring in raw rubber, we did, I don't know if they're doing, we're not barging now, to the port of Paducah, our state facility. We offloaded raw rubber there and it would be, and it would be then shipped over to Eddyville. It turned into tires. Save their, that saved that one plant, $1.5 million of transportation costs. Because they had to get used to, all right, we can, we can keep our inventory rather than in New Orleans and have it two days away. We can keep it in Paducah. It's still two days away, or it's a day away, or it's a half a day away. And but we have to barge it. So we have to, we have to eat the inventory and have it float up. So that's been going on now for 15, 20 years. No, not quite 20, but it's been going on for quite a while. So it's just changing the mindset. Uh, Ford Motor Company is another one. Big oversized trucks. Can't put them on a flatbed. Got to move them by rail. Well, you know what? You can float them. We can float them for you. We have to build racks for you to put them in. <laughs> Steve, that, that's a f phenomenal thing about. And and that's, that's breaking, you know, that's thinking inside the barge, outside the box. If, if I can stay, you know, keep to the story. To do that, it takes many people to come together and yeah. kind of visualize that. What, how does that, how would you involve different participants, especially if the Riverport directors, shippers, how do you bring that together? Even I guess with the state of Kentucky transportation, economic development, what does that team look like to try to make something like that come together? Initially, it's a bunch of NDAs that get signed. <laughs> <laughs> and then we all Appreciate sit it. down, uh, historically sit down in a room and say, all right, GM, what are you trying to get done? Well, gee, we can we can take this product, put it on a deck barge. You're going to get X number of bar, you know, units on a on a barge. I got a port director here from Henderson who can roll them off for us. He can even store them for us in his yard. He's got room. It's all fenced in and protected. And oh, where do you need it delivered to? Well, I have to get it to X Y Z facility. Well, we can arrange with our local short line to do that. Or if need be, we can, we can load them on trucks and move them at night, whenever the, you know, whenever the, the state says we're allowed to move them. So it, it takes a lot of, and it takes a lot of time because when you start changing logistical modes for a big, huge corporation like, like Ford or GM or um, even FedEx by barge, uh, or Amazon by river. Um, these things that are, are, are today, well, yesterday unheard of, today they're, they're taking place. And it's people that, that are, at least most of the time it's somebody at the facility or the shipper or producer that has got a logistical background and can think creatively and wants to do something different. And um, they'll come and they'll, they want to have a dial, have a, a, you know, a communication or sit down and, and talk about it. And I've been, I told our, our owners recently, I said, I wish I was 20 years younger. This industry won't look the same 20 years from now. It won't, it'll be, we won't just be moving bulk cargo from A to B. It's going to be a, an amazing um, ride to be in our industry. And we have the ports set up today in the state of Kentucky to take advantage of that. It, it's rare. Well, and I like it. That's, that's a good segue. Come back to a question that Bill Kinsler asked earlier. Well, better quit asking questions. <laughs> I know. He, he's just <laughs> such a good guy, isn't he? We got a couple. I want to know that we get to one from Timothy Hughes here in a moment. And Timothy, by the way, is going to be chairing or moderating the commodities panel first thing tomorrow morning. So folks, uh, 830 uh, a.m. Central Time, 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time, uh, we'll have the commodities, and that's going to be a really good panel. I, I'm, 
I, I wish everyone could have been here, but Adam's taking good notes. And I know Timothy is too. They're going to borrow a lot from this panel for tomorrow. Uh, I'm putting Adam on the spot now. But what tools does the Kentucky Transportation Department, and let me open it up to this. What tools have you seen other, whether department, uh, transportation departments, economic development departments, have to assist terminals and operators to identify companies with origin destination pairs that are conducive for his question was around a container on barge, but I'll open that up to other things. What what tools have you seen or what tools are lacking from a state perspective to help develop that? I think there's a little bit of a fear when uh, it's more of a, a protectionism when somebody comes in and wants to talk to the economic development group about the building facility on a piece of land. Well, everybody gets protective of that piece of the pie. So they don't want to share with transportation, with anybody in DOT, with the port directors. Port directors may hear about it and not want to share as well. So what's happening right now, as I said earlier in my, com in, in my comments in the state of Kentucky, I think that I think that 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 wall has been knocked down or it's being knocked down. And those dialogues are now taking place um, in Frankfurt and, and out of the ports and, you know, downtown at the transportation head office and having those communications that, Hey, we have an opportunity to generate more tax-based revenue in the state of Kentucky and keep our people employed. And a lot of States don't do that yet. We do that and we're starting to do that. And we're not there yet, but this thing is going on right now. It's certainly a major step forward to to see that come to fruition. Um, I, you know, the largest industry in the state of Kentucky is aerospace, right? Did you know that? I wasn't thinking aerospace, but I could see that with the big uh, northern it Kentucky is. now, and now with, of course, Louisville with the rural port. And so how how do we as a transportation mode feed that transportation mode? And by the way, me coming from a, uh, we have a little fly-by-night company here in Memphis called FedEx, so I'm, I'm familiar. Yeah, I've been, <laughs> been down there a few times. Yeah. So how do we, um, as an industry and as, and as a state, support that with all different modes of transportation? For instance, in, in Kentucky, at our amazing CBG airport, through the work of our state governments and our local governments, we're successful in getting Amazon to build this monster facility right on airport property in Hebron, Kentucky. Now, did I like it? No, because they find them damn big old jets right over my house. Because I live, I live, but I knew when I bought, when I bought the house, I lived, I lived in the, I lived in on, on, on that path. So nonetheless, they built this warehouse. Most of that product came up by water that built those facilities. Mm. And I will assure you that there will be product moving to that Amazon facility in the next five years by the river. Well, and, and you said that with our already happening with the waste and making those boxes that then get transformed to move packages in. Exactly. Those boxes can get really quick from Wapakoneta, Wapakoneta Ohio to CBG's airport in a matter of hours. But that raw material that feeds that is coming from St. Louis, Memphis, New Orleans. It's actually being bought out from under the Chinese government who were trying to buy it and move it into China and turn it into pulp paper. So kudos to whoever put that deal together. <laughs> well, I'll do a better job here in Memphis to sort my uh, cardboard better then. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you need to do that because the, most of the paper is coming from your backyard, brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. We got into a good spot that it's going to. Steve, we, we've got 15 minutes here, and, and the, the people have been putting questions in. I mean, great. Uh, if there's any questions, by all means, raise your hands or, or put them into uh, the message here, and, and we'll be having them here. Uh, I like this question from Tim. Um, this is around from a logistics standpoint, and this comes back to something we said at the very beginning uh, about competitiveness. And, and from the commodity shipments out of Kentucky uh, to a global marketplace where we're seeing a lot of growth that is emerging and, uh, and is, is sustaining itself in, in many regards. Um, how is these, the Kentucky ports becoming more or less competitive with other domestic or foreign suppliers? And what 
what does Kentucky need to do to preserve or, and grow these markets? And so there's a couple of questions. There's kind of loaded, but there's a lot to it because infrastructure uh, that you float over and roll over is very, very important for those assets than for the commodities. I don't believe the world knows what Kentucky has to offer from a port standpoint. Um, they don't realize we have these 11 facilities available to them. And I don't blame anybody for that. It's, it's, it's something that's developed over the last three to seven years as businesses have come to the state or come through the state to ship their products in and out all over the world, um, they don't know that we exist. They just know they need to find a dock. And if you don't want to, for instance, Newport is a prime example. Why did Newport build a dock to handle their steel when we should have been building that dock ourselves? Why did they have to do, why did they, they I mean, I, I'll build a dock as Ingram, that's fine. That just makes Ingram more important. We as a, we as a state, um, and we haven't had to. I mean, we, you know, we're sustainable by stainless steel that comes in, by aluminum, by bulk cargoes we move in and out, um, wood chips and print and uh, all the stuff that normally moves by water. But the business is changing and there's gonna be more and more products moving in and out of the state. And the world needs to know whether it's the economic development group or the transportation department in and of itself. Hey, we have all this available to you to use. Our state facilities are competitive, very competitive, and they are modern. I'm also on that board, so we can we do get to spend some of our tax dollars in the state, keeping them up to date. So um, they are modern, and we have some very intelligent port directors, um, smart smart people that have been doing this a while and. Uh, but they're running the day to day. So we got to get to the global level and let the world know that this little, this little state right in the middle of the country here has this phenomenal interface. This the system set up that you can basically do anything you want to do through here. It's not hazardous. You can. Well, you, I shouldn't say that. Even hazardous with, with that happens in Paducah. <laughs> so yeah. the, the point is, is the products are here. The, the opportunity is here and the we just need to let the world know that that um, these these facilities these assets exist yeah and I, I can tell you our governor would be shy about spending money if it means more jobs for the state of, of Kentucky well and if we think about the state of Kentucky you've between you've you've, you've got the, the eastern side kind of the north and then uh, west and maybe the central. And, and there's been different types of commodities that have moved through those different regions at different times. How do you see, for example, on the, let's say the Eastern side of the state, where you've got multiple states together, there's been a transformation of the type of commodity that's flowing. How does one tr attract it's or it's shifting, bring forward? It's shifting from center or west, that's from, from what I see. Um, the state of Indiana, Kentucky parts, and, some, and somewhat Ohio, um, it's a lot more industry friendly, for instance, and there's not, you don't have the demand for the coal, the mines are gone, the power plants are gone, um, the inbound raw materials are gone. So it seems to me that things are shifting, uh, maybe from say Ashland West and that's where the focus is, is going to be on. It should probably be farther up east, but where's that stuff going to go when it all flows? Or where's it going to come from when it loads? Um, yeah, there was a big push for a while on fracking up in that part of, across the river in Ohio and Pennsylvania. Um, and we did move a lot of sand into that area. But from a growth standpoint, Ashland and West seems to be where the demand's heading. And it makes sense because that's where the, that's where the people are. That's where the products are needed. And that last mile of transportation, the closer you get to that point, the most 
the best you can, you can, how you can profitize your business. So um, I think it's going to continue to be from Ashley, Kentucky, maybe even a little bit farther west than there. Uh, not somewhere between Mays going Ashland and West. <laughs> and Ashland's big enough. So in Ashland and West is where the demand is. And it's on both sides of the river. And um, there's a lot of ways to get from our side to the other side. Well, and you bring up a good point. And I know this is a, the, I don't know if Jeremy's going to get upset with me, but this is a Kentucky River Ports project. But what you do on one side of the river, and if you get, make for a lot of improvements, you bring a lot of cargo in, that means there's opportunities on the other side just by virtue that there's more volume. Oh, yeah. and, and volumes speak volumes and it attracts itself. Now you have both sides and it's two different political boundaries, but or to, uh, across the line from a political boundary that now a, 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 support, a rising tide lists all boats. It, is that something you see regularly that do you support one another that way? I think it just naturally happens, especially if you're, if you're close to a bridge or an interstate. It's going to naturally flow that way. Um, some companies are going to stay on the, on the north side of the river just because of legacy issues. Um, but as they grow their business, the opportunity to ship it in this, into Kentucky and take it across a bridge or put it in a barge and take it across the river, which isn't, which isn't that far-fetched of an idea. It's, it's being talked about today. Um, because there's some not so friendly private operations on Ohio and Indiana, uh, not all of Indiana, but uh, parts of Indiana, that it make, makes more sense to offload in Kentucky, warehouse it, put in a barge and float it four miles up across the river and offload it. Various opportunities around that. And as we come here to the final stretch and Steve you've been phenomenal uh, I could go all afternoon with you but uh, you got a barge business to run um, this continuing on a the theme of other states and Jimmy's asked a question around what other examples uh, what other states have examples where they're uh, recognizing waterways uh, as a well, transportation Alabama resource has years. Alabama's been ahead of everybody um, state docks they put a they, they put a a uh, terminal operation in um, years ago and out of Wamba, Alabama, I was on the 10th on board. I'm like, what is that? What is this? What are you doing? And when I went up and saw it, I'm like, well, this is really good. And those containers should have, it should have been an ideal location to put a container terminal to feed the auto industry coming into Alabama and Tennessee and Mississippi. It didn't quite happen out that way, but that was an ideal turn point for containers to come in. They built a massive operation, but state of Alabama's done a good job. Uh, Missouri is, they're trying, they have, they have a big river over there, <laughs> just west of St. Louis. And I spent, uh, well, I did it, one of my associate team members, I sent him over there. He drove that river for about four months, both sides, from one end all the way up to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And you would think there's a great opportunity in that river for business. The state wants it to be, but their river isn't really set up for large volumes of river traffic. So um, yeah, they're trying. Arkansas is industry friendly, real industry friendly. They love steel industry. As long as they build it on, on the lower mist, they're fine. But if they start building on, a, on the Arkansas River, they're screwed because it's a, it's, it's a, we run there, but it's, it's, it's a terrible river to operate on because there's, you have the same problems there as you have in the lower mesh. You have a lot of river operating problems with high water, low water, small toes, and a minimal number of people that actually play over there. Hmm. So Alabama's still strong. Um, I would have thought Mississippi would have gotten on board by now, but you just don't hear a lot out of them in the, in the, at the 10 time meetings. Um, Indiana has a pretty vibrant program, but it's really a private public program. So they have to partner with the private sector on the waterways or inland. Um, but Kentucky, Kentucky has the biggest opportunity of those along the waterway. And people are moving south. <laughs> Plain and simple, they're moving south. And 
I've got neighbors that just bought by me. They don't talk like me. I don't know where they came from, but they don't talk like me. <laughs> <laughs> They're not from around here. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if we think here around the, the ports themselves, what could they collectively do in, in achieving the greatest shift here in a focus and investment from, from the state as a collective body? I would be working hand in hand with economic development. I'd be going through Frankfurt to get some kind of advertising firm under, under the payroll to market the state operated facilities. And I think, I think the revenue will far exceed the cost to get something out there to the rest of the world to see that, hey, here sits, well, if you're a Kentucky, UK fan, here sits this little blue state if you're a Louisville fan, here's this little red state. But nonetheless, here's the state that's right in the middle of everything, within 250 miles of most everything you need to get to in the Midwest. And they're kind of an unknown entity. So I would, I would make sure that the economic development group, which is doing a fantastic job, by the way, um, talking to all the people out there in the world that are trying to, that want to build. But they, you can't forget that you have this facility these operating entities that you own sitting in the state. For instance, Port of Louisville, what is it, three miles from the airport? I'll bet you the port hadn't brought anything in that's went to that airport in 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just, you have to run it like a business, like a private end, like a private industry, and you have to run it like you have 11 of them. Not 11 different cost centers, 11 different pieces of a profit center where one can make the other equally as, as, as profitable. It might make sense to go to Henderson. It might make more sense to go to Owensboro. It might make more sense to come up here in the northern part of the state. So get those, get those groups talking on a regular basis, sharing with what they're doing, come up with a marketing plan and present it to one, the industry. So we know other people know, I know it's there because I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be in some of the state advisory boards, but um, the industry needs to know and the world needs to know that, you know, as, as your handout from the economic development group is why I come to Kentucky, here's a big reason why right here. We have these state owned entities available to service you on the, on the most efficient interstate system in the world. They well, end it, it, and you're right, Steve, and um, there's so much to be extracted here. And one last question here before we close out came from Scott Sigmund about how can the inland waterway shippers collaborate in a very similar vein as, uh, as ports together? How can shippers do something? Do you see that? Is there something that they can be focused on as shippers? That, <laughs> shippers love the waterways.com. Uh, is there something around that to, that shippers could collectively come together? Reach out to Bill Kinsler. He, he explained to you a program in the Cincinnati area called Corba. And Corba took Cincinnati Harbor and expanded it almost to Louisville and almost Huntington, West Virginia. He created this massive entity that all these private docks participate in and market and advertise with the state of Kentucky, Indiana, and Ohio under OKI. So they're doing it. Um, it was done, I think the Port of Huntington, West Virginia did it first. And when they got them with their spread, they're like, hey, we have 382 miles of river opportunity that presents, you know, a hundred billion dollars worth of opportunity stuff. So it's, it's doable. Um, Bill was, I think, the current president of, uh, of Corba or chairman, whatever they call him. Um, he has some pretty good insights how to do it. Uh, he's older than me, but he has more energy than me. <laughs> well, Steve, <laughs> uh, with that, our energy uh, can, can keep going, but we've come to the end of this time. I want to thank you very much, Steve, for devoting as much time as you have for a resilient system uh, as we saw just yesterday and, and what you guys have prepared as an industry to keep it going. Uh, we are glad to hear that uh, your crews are all safe uh, despite a broken leg. We pray and hope that that's all that it will be. But Steve, 
from everybody on here, I give a collective uh, round of applause. And I know the rest of your co compadres who would have been on here would say the same thing. Fantastic job, Steve. And, and with that, Jimmy, I turn it back over to you. Okay, well, I really appreciate it. And uh, Steve, I would like to personally thank you as well. Um, just did a great job. I think so many good nuggets here. We recorded the session so um, folks can dig into a lot of what you said and just hearing from the industry, um, you know, what's going on, you know, and, and the last thing you said just, just was so good, you know, the, the ports collectively um, working together and letting the industry know what they're doing, you know, we uh, just a, a great continuation of what uh, has been started here with these three summits and with this port study that the state's doing. And I think that moving that uh, moving that forward and making that a priority, um, you know, you said another thing, uh, Kentucky has the greatest opportunity here on the waterway, as you see it from one of the largest barge uh, companies in, in the country. So appreciate everything you told us. So much insight and so much uh, help for uh, our study efforts and uh, look forward to, to, to seeing and meeting you again in the future, maybe in person. And uh, I, I second what Ken said, uh, hope everybody down south is safe and, and is able to to uh, to come back as strong uh, as, as they as they always are. And uh, that being said, we're going to close this session up. Um, we we're able to, to get it right to the end here. We will be meeting again at 9.30 in the morning Eastern time. That's 8.30 Central. So sorry for uh, the early wake up, but hopefully you'll get your egg McMuffin and coffee and join us to hear about uh, the evolution of freight commodities on the waterways and uh, hear from some major uh, industries that, that are serving the state of Kentucky. So to that, I say thank you to everyone who was able to join us and look forward to seeing you all again in the morning. Have a great afternoon. Take care. Thank you.